All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to week 13. Uh, we are now officially in the home stretch of this semester. Uh, you should be really proud of the work you've done so far. And if there's anything I can do to help you kind of stay motivated or stay on the ball uh, during these last few weeks, just let me know. Uh, we have a lot of ground to cover today, so I'll just kind of jump right into things. Um, but these last few weeks are just going to be spent working on the different components of your final projects. So as you'll see um, in the on the final project assignment sheet uh, that you'll be looking at after you watch this lecture, uh, your final project will be a business report, specifically a recommendation report, uh, which I'll talk about a little later on in this presentation, but there are a few different components. So you'll be putting together something called a work report, which we'll talk about today and you read about in the textbook, um, an annotated bibliography of the research that you do, um, and the recommendation report itself. So talking a little bit more about business reports and what it's like to report in the digital age workplace, as the textbook calls it, um, efficient reporting is really what helps companies make major decisions. Um, good reports can make or break um, big movements or choices that a company needs to make. Uh, reports can vary greatly in length, content, form, and formality level. So they can be a really routine, sort of casual thing, or they can be very formal. It kind of depends on how big the decision that's being made is, uh, your professional relationship with whoever you're actually reporting to, um, and things like that. Despite these variations, every report has one or more of these purposes and that's to convey information, to answer questions, or to solve problems. So typically a report is gonna have a combination of at least two of those. Uh, it's pretty rare that you'd see something with just one of those purposes, but there's always gonna be one of those at play in a business report. Uh, basic report functions. So what reports are meant to do? Um, there are two main sort of types of business reports and the first one is an informational report and these present data without analysis or recommendation so it's just kind of a simple summary of here's some statistics or facts or research that i did no opinion presented no suggestions made uh, informational reports include documents like monthly sales reports progress reports uh, and government compliance reports so a lot of informational reports are sort of um, the reports that people come to respect or expect. They're very routine. Um, people are really used to the way information is presented. So you're able to just kind of be um, like just a bare bones summary there. But the other kind is an analytical report. And an analytical report uh, presents data or findings, analyses, and conclusions. So you're going to do what an informational report does, present that data, but then analyze the data and form conclusions based off of it. And we'll talk more about what exactly drawing those conclusions and explaining them looks like later on. Uh, this can also include recommendations, which is what we'll be doing for the final project as you're writing a recommendation report. Uh, surprise, surprise. And they may intend to persuade readers to act or change their beliefs. So say if you're recommending something, it could be, you know, to change some sort of policy within the company, things like that. So informational, no kind of persuasion, just kind of a straight up summary. Analytical, you're analyzing, drawing conclusions, and most likely suggesting something at the end. Organizational strategies for business reports. As we've seen time and time again, you can use direct strategy, uh, which in the context of business reports, uh, places the purpose for writing close to the beginning. Really typical of informational reports, again, just because usually with an informational report, it's something that someone has come to expect. It's really routine, so there's no need to kind of explain the information before actually presenting it. 
Uh, direct strategy can be used in analytical reports when you have supportive readers. So if you know that your audience is going to react positively to whatever conclusion you're drawing or they're looking for this information, you can use direct strategy. But if that's not the case, you'd probably want to use indirect. Indirect with business reports include conclusions and recommendations at the end of the report. So uh, it's really helpful for readers who are unfamiliar with the topic or might react negatively. So you would want to kind of present all of your findings, the data you found, the research you've done, um, draw conclusions, and then make suggestions. The indirect strategy can seem rational to readers because it follows a sort of natural thought process, or even more so, it's almost set up more of like a typical essay format, like you're presenting information and then making your argument. Uh, these are just some little infographics from the textbooks, from the textbook, excuse me, that are sort of helpful for when to use direct or indirect and kind of a bare bones outline for what that would look like. So I'm not going to read through this entire table, um, but this is just some kind of comparisons of informal and formal writing style. Like I said earlier on, um, reports can vary greatly on whether they're formal or informal. So you would kind of want to go through um, your specific situation and purpose and figure out what writing style is best for you. So this might be something useful to come back to. Um, but I'm not going to make you sit through me reading an entire table. Applying the 3x3 three three process to reports. So another thing we've seen time and time again this semester. Uh, step one, analyze the problem and purpose. So I'm going to break down all of these steps um, later on, but this is just kind of a rundown of the list. And this is also kind of stretching out the 3x3 three three writing process. So there's more than just three steps, but they all kind of fall into those um, larger categories of the 3x3 three three writing process. Step two is anticipate the audience and issues. Step three, prepare a work plan, which is actually going to be the first step in your final project. That's going to be the first component of it. Step four, conduct research. Step five, organize, analyze, interpret, and illustrate the data. Step six, compose the first draft. And step seven, edit, proofread, and evaluate. So the only two steps we won't be breaking down in this presentation are steps six and seven, um, just because they're pretty run of the mill. It's kind of the same process you use for any type of genre that you're writing in. But of course, if you have questions about those steps later on, just let me know. So first step, analyzing the problem and purpose. The first step of report is understanding the problem or task clearly. You need to know exactly what you're trying to achieve, what problem you're trying to solve, what kind of solution you're looking for. It helps to come up with a problem statement and then a problem question. So a problem statement really breaks down in detail what kind of problem you're facing. So an example from the textbook would be, the leases on all company cars will be expiring in three months. FarmGen must decide whether to renew them or develop a new policy regarding transportation for sales reps. Expenses and paperwork for employee-owned cars seems excessive. So we have kind of the overarching problem that this lease is going to expire, um, but then sort of the sub-problems, like we need to make this decision, are we going to renew them, develop a new policy? So it's just kind of breaking down the details as concisely as possible. So you can kind of look at the problem from the bigger picture. And a problem question to go off of that problem statement would be, what plan should FarmGen follow in providing transportation for its sales reps? So once you figure out what the problem is, you want to see how you can kind of morph that into a question, and that will be your platform for conducting research. Uh, more with analyzing the problem and purpose. Once you have your problem statement and question, you can focus on the purpose. 
A statement of purpose defines the focus of a report and provides a goal that keeps the project on target. So it's a concise statement that you can kind of keep in the back of your mind that this is what I'm trying to accomplish. So you never kind of lose that main goal that you set out for in the beginning. In writing a purpose statement, you want to use action verbs um, as per usual. Uh, verbs like analyze, choose, investigate, compare, justify, establish are all great. Uh, they show that you're really taking action and moving forward with this uh, sort of research process. More analyzing the problem and purpose. Expanded statements of purpose call for three additional factors. That's scope, limitations, and significance. So what's the scope of your issue or problem? What are the limitations? And what's the significance? Breaking down th that down a little further, when you're thinking about scope, you want to ask yourself these questions. So what issues or elements will be investigated? So if we're thinking of that example from FarmGen and the car leases, you're going to investigate um, whether the lease should be renewed, you'd probably look into like the cost of the lease, the cost of purchasing cars, things like that. Uh, this prepares the audience by clearly defining which problem or problems will be analyzed and solved. When you're thinking about the limitations of your topic, you want to think about what conditions affect the generalizability and utility of a report's findings. Um, this further narrows the subject by focusing on constraints and exclusions. So what are you not going to be able to cover in this report? Or um, what are readers not going to understand? What's actually going to be applicable information to these problems or your report? And significance. So simply, why is this topic worth investigating at this time? So again, if you were going back to the farm gen example and the lease is on cars, um, it would be significant because that lease expires in three months. So you want to think about that in terms of sort of timeliness. So an extended, uh, excuse me, an expanded statement of purpose would be the purpose of this report is to recommend a plan that provides sales reps with cars to be used in their calls. The report will compare costs for three plans, outright ownership, leasing, and compensation for employee-owned cars. It will also measure employment reactions to each plan. The report is significant because FarmGen's current leasing agreement expires March 31st, and an improved plan could reduce costs and paperwork. The study is limited to costs for sales reps in the Kansas City District. So really breaking down what the scope of it is, what exactly we're going to be looking at. We're going to be looking at three specific plans, tells us exactly why it's significant, the fact that the lease expires on March 31st, and tells us that the limitation um, is the fact that they're only looking at prices in the Kansas City district. So when you make your own uh, expanded statement of purpose, this is a good model to kind of follow. The next step in this process is anticipating the audience and issues. Concentrating only on your primary reader is a mistake. Uh, business reports get passed around a lot. They get filtered through a lot of different people. So you want to make sure that the information you convey is going to be understood by a wider audience. Consider these questions when you're thinking about who, is exa who exactly is going to be looking at your report. What do your readers need to know about this topic? What do they already know? Um, don't waste their time with giving them information that's already readily available to them or that might be really obvious. What's their education level? Uh, are they going to understand, you know, really dense terminology or jargon? What are you going to have to define or cite? How will they react to this information? Is it something they have come to expect? Is it something they're excited about? Is it something that's going to be bad news for them? Which sources will they trust? So when you're thinking about doing research and citing sources, what are they going to find credible? What might they kind of not be comfortable with? Those, that's a really important thing to consider. And ask yourself, how can I make this information readable, believable, and memorable? So a good question to ask for all of your writing. 
that relates to organization, research, formatting, all that good stuff. So with anticipating the audience and issues, you'll need to do some factoring. Uh, and that means breaking down the major investigative problem into smaller sub-problems. So for example, one of the larger problems of this farm gen example is should farm gen purchase cars outright? So their lease is expiring. Should they just cancel the lease or not renew it and purchase their own cars? So you could break that down into smaller problems like how much capital would be required? How much would it cost? Um, how much would it cost to insure, operate, and maintain these cars? Would that cost sort of outweigh the cost of actually leasing cars? Uh, do employees prefer using company-owned cars? Would they rather drive cars that weren't on a lease? Another major problem that you could break down is should farm gen lease cars? So should the lease be continued? And what is the best lease price available? So think of how you can make these problems smaller and smaller so you can address every issue that may come up with your reader. Next step is preparing a work plan. Uh, and this is really important because like I said, this is going to be the first component of your final project. So pay extra attention here. A good work plan includes a statement of the problem based on key background and contextual information, statement of purpose, including the scope, limitations, and significance. So we've gone over both of these. A research strategy, including a description of potential sources and methods of collecting data. Uh, that sounds a lot fancier than it is. It's really just an explanation of how you're going to go about finding out more information on this topic. So if you were actually conducting this in a workplace and not in the middle of a pandemic, you might conduct a survey among your coworkers or you might hold a focus group. Um, for your purposes, it's probably be going to be something along the lines of online research, you know, using the UWM library or search engines, whatever works best for you and your topic. A tentative outline that factors the problem into manageable chunks. This doesn't necessarily determine the order or content of the final report. So this um, order and outline can kind of change as you start actually composing your report and a work schedule. So how you're kind of going to manage your time, how long this project is probably going to take. Uh, your work reports are obviously going to look a little different. If you were conducting this in an actual workplace, it might be a sort of months long process or weeks long process. And here, obviously, we wrap up at the end of the semester. So your work schedule is going to look pretty short. Uh, but you can find an example of a work plan in chapter 11 of the textbook. So if you need something to kind of go off of, that's a really good platform to use. But you want to make sure that you have all of these components. Some tips for preparing a work plan. Start early and allow plenty of time for brainstorming and preliminary research. So it's kind of a more complex document than it seems. And the more detailed you are now, the easier it's going to be to write your report. The work plan works really well as sort of a jumping point for your report. Uh, describe the problem motivating the report. So go through that process of writing out your um, problem statement and question and really work with that and work through that. Write a purpose statement that includes the report's scope, significance, and limitations. Describe the research strategy, including data collection sources and methods. So while I don't necessarily require you to go ahead and list actual sources on your work report, you can kind of just talk about the strategy and sort of general sources that you'll be looking for. It will make it easier on you if you go ahead and find a couple sources and list them just so you have them to come back to. And divide the major problem into sub-problems stated as questions to be answered, like we saw in the example a few slides back. Um, making these sub-problems into questions to be answered make them really easy to use as sort of platforms for researching because you know exactly what you're looking for, you know exactly what kind of answer that you're seeking out. So I would say the main tip here is starting early. 
you'll notice when you look at the week 13 schedule that the work report isn't actually due um, this week. It's due the following week. I just want you to have plenty of time to kind of work through this because I know these processes are kind of complex. So just make sure you give yourself enough time. I know everyone's really swamped. Um, and of course, if you need any assistance with this, just let me know. Some more tips. Uh, develop a realistic work schedule, citing dates for the completion of major tasks. So obviously we have some pretty strict deadlines in here since it is a class, but I would recommend setting some sort of soft deadlines for yourself too. So say by a certain date you hope to have found three sources and read through them, or you hope to have completed your problem statement and problem question by this date, things like that that are just going to be more helpful for you. And review the work plan with whoever authorized the report. So you obviously kind of have to do this if you want to receive a grade on it, since I'm the one who's authorizing the report. Um, but in a more sort of real world situation, you would run it by a supervisor, coworker, whoever you're working with on this. Uh, just some tips here for conducting research. I'm not going to go through this completely, um, but here is whatever kind of data you're looking for as far as what kind of citations you find yourself wanting to make. These are some really helpful questions to ask as sort of a platform for conducting that research. So this would be a really helpful table to come back to once you start finding those resources or even when you're kind of planning out your research strategy for the work report. Documenting information. So once you have found your research, um, if you want to include any sources within your work report or eventually when you're writing your recommendation report, here are some tips for documenting information in business reports. Uh, the purposes of documentation in a business report, they're pretty similar to, you know, documentation or citations in every other form of writing. They strengthen your argument. You get backup from expert opinions and formal research. Uh, to protect yourself against charges of plagiarism, of course, to instruct the reader, so to teach them more about maybe a complex topic or things they didn't necessarily know about, uh, to save time. So this means you don't have to go out and do primary research yourself. You can just cite something that someone else has found about a similar topic or problem. Um, and what to document. So what kind of information do you need to document or cite within your report? Another person's ideas, opinions, examples, or theories. Again, it's pretty much run of the mill for any type of writing. Um, any facts, stats, graphs, and drawings that aren't common knowledge. So you'll need to cite visuals, um, which I can provide you with some resources for how to actually write that citation. Uh, quotations of another person's written or spoken words, paraphrases of another person's spoken or written words. So if it's not necessarily a direct quotation, but it's still information that's coming from them, go ahead and cite it. Usually the rule is when in doubt cite, but if you're ever really unsure of something, just let me know. Um, I trust you all that you're not going to intentionally plagiarize, and I know sometimes it gets kind of confusing. Um, so if you're ever in doubt, you can look it up. There's lots of good resources out there. Or just let me know. I'm happy to help. You also want to cite, like I said, visuals, images, or any kind of electronic media. And once we move into the annotated bibliography component of the final project, I'll share some really good citation resources for you to look off of, um, just in case you don't know how to cite those kinds of things. Matching graphics and objectives. So graphics are a sort of significant component to business reports, and you are able to include them in a work report. It's not required, um, but it is going to be required in the business report. So this is good information to know. Uh, in developing graphics, you have to decide what data you want to highlight and which graphics are most appropriate given your objective. So depending on what you want to show, a certain sort of graph or visual might work better than another kind. This is a sort of helpful illustration from the textbook. Um, 
based on what kind of purpose each visual has. So something like a table is useful to show exact figures and values. Uh, bar charts or bar graphs are useful to compare one item with others. So once you kind of figure out your information and organize it, figure out how you want to present it visually, this will be a really useful thing to come back to, um, to sort of get an idea of what visual you should use exactly. Incorporating graphics into reports. So you want to make sure when you're choosing a graphic, you also evaluate the audience. So what are they going to understand? Are they going to respond really well to something more simple like a bar graph or a flow chart? Or will they expect, you know, a really um, complex sort of scientific graph? Or is that something that they're just going to completely not understand and not respond well to? Uh, use restraint. It can be really tempting to kind of plug in a lot of photos and things that are pleasing to the eye. Um, but you want to make sure that this is just kind of a complement to the actual written information you have. Not that it's just sort of a report full of graphs and things with some writing interspersed between. Be accurate and ethical. Make sure that any graphs or visuals you use are accurate. Uh, make sure you're ethical and citing wherever you get information or visuals from. Introduce a graph meaningfully um, or any sort of visual. Don't just sort of copy and paste it within the report. Make sure you're actually offering context for what this visual is and what exactly it's explaining. Choose an appropriate caption or title style. Um, so you can either have like a subtitle underneath whatever visual you have. You can title it uh, whatever really works best for you. Um, there are a couple different kinds of titles when it comes to this. The first one is called a talking title. Uh, and this is more persuasive because it sort of tells a reader what to think. So an example of that would be if you were showing some sort of graph, uh, rising workplace drug testing, unfair and inaccurate. So if you're making some sort of overarching argument about this, it might be the way to go for your visuals. The other option is a descriptive title, and this describes facts more objectively. An example of that would be workplace drug testing up 277%. So this would kind of depend on your audience, your purpose, what kind of report you're doing. Um, so just use your best judgment in picking titles for your visuals or graphics. And finally, promise we're almost done. I know this is a long lecture, uh, analytical reports. So this is kind of the larger category of business reports that we're gonna be working with for the final project. So we've talked about what the work report is gonna look like. We've talked a little bit about documentation, which relates to the annotated bibliography and the final component of the final project. Uh, the biggest component of it is this analytical report, specifically a recommendation report. Analytical reports collect and evaluate data, typically to try to persuade the reader to accept conclusions and act on the recommendations. Remember, conclusions are what the problem is and recommendations are how to solve it. So just because you draw a conclusion does not mean that you've necessarily given your audience any instruction on how to move forward with this problem. So you really want to make sure that your work or your business report, excuse me, is going to have some sort of recommendations or solutions. Which is why we are doing justification and recommendation reports. Uh, these justify or recommend actions such as buying equipment, changing a policy or procedure, hiring an employee or investing funds. Uh, there are examples of these on page 461 and 462 in the textbook. For the purposes of the final project, you're going to be able to choose between three different prompts for a recommendation report that are going to be related to changing a policy or procedure. So that's kind of what we're going to be focusing in on. These can use direct or indirect strategy. That's really up to you and what you feel like the purpose is. Um, you can work through that, and of course, if you need advice, let me know. Um, but moving forward for that, you want to use direct strategy for non-sensitive topics and recommendations that will be agreeable for readers. 
So if you decide you want to use direct strategy, organize your report in the following sequence. Identify the problem or need briefly. Announce the recommendation, solution, or action concisely and with action verbs. Explain more fully the benefits of the recommendation or steps necessary to solve the problem. So here you'd list out the recommendation sort of in a big picture sense, and here you would start to break it down um, with exactly what you mean and how they would move forward with that recommendation. Include a discussion of pros, cons, and costs. And conclude with a summary specifying the recommendation and the necessary action. So that's if you want to use direct strategy. Again, it's up to you. Um, you'll pick your prompt and kind of move through the work report. It's a decision you'll make down the line. There's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. Just use your best judgment. Use indirect strategy for a recommendation report when a reader may oppose a recommendation or when circumstances suggest caution. Uh, here, do not rush to reveal your recommendation. You want to be really careful about that. If you use indirect strategy, organize your report in the following sequence. Refer to the problem in general terms, not to your recommendation in the subject line or title. Describe the problem or need or recommend the recommendation addresses. Sorry, that's a typo. Uh, use specific examples, supporting statistics, and authoritative quotes to lend credibility to the seriousness of the problem. So you'll start out here by really breaking down actually what the problem is and why the problem needs to be addressed. Discuss alternative solutions, beginning with the least likely to succeed. So if you remember back with that um, statement on the farm gen example, they talk about how they're going to address three possible solutions. Um, that would be a good option here, a few different options. Present the most promising alternative, your recommendation last, so it's really fresh in their minds. Show how the advantages of your recommendation outweigh its disadvantages. And summarize your recommendation. If appropriate, specify the action it requires. And ask for authorization to proceed if necessary. So, after all that, um, up next for this week, after watching this lecture, you'll go to Canvas and carefully read over the final project assignment sheet. It breaks down each component of the final project. Um, that is the work report, the annotated bibliography, and the actual um, recommendation report itself. Uh, kind of gives you more insight on the formatting of those things, point value. Uh, and then you'll complete the week 13 survey. So the week 13 survey is going to ask you to pick from one of the three prompts for the final project. And that will also give you space to ask any questions or address any concerns you have about the final project after reading over the assignment sheet. After that, go ahead and begin drafting your work report. So like I said earlier, that's not actually due until next week. Um, but I really, really recommend going ahead and giving yourself some time on this. So if you have any questions, you can either address them in the week 13 survey, reach out to me during office hours or through email. Um, yeah, thanks for listening. I hope you're all doing well and that you have a great last few weeks of the semester. I'll be in touch.